And we're off and running. Okay. Yep. Sure. All right. So, oxidation. It is the charge that an atom or an ion has when it fills its octet, when it completes its octet. So, follow the little green dot, if you would. Okay. Group 1 elements have how many valence electrons? One. one. So lithium, sodium, potassium, they have one valence electron. If you found lithium on the street and asked them, hey, lithium, what do you want to do to get rid of your octet? What do you want to do to get rid of, to make your octet? What is it going to say? Get rid of one. Now, electrons are negatively charged. So if you get rid of a negative electron, what does your charge become? Positive. Positive one. Good. Good. So lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, and cesium, all of group one have an oxidation of plus one. Now, beryllium's group have two outer electrons. What do they want to do? Get rid of two. So if you get rid of two, what's your charge? Plus two. Plus two. So group two has an oxidation of plus two. We're going to skip over the D-block and come back to it. The halogens, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, and acetine, these guys have how many outer electrons? Seven. Seven. What, is, what do they want to do? They want to get one more. What's the charge of an electron? Negative one. Negative one. So if you gain one more, your charge becomes? Negative. Negative one. Are you seeing the pattern? Yes. So the oxidation is the charge, plus or minus, that an atom will have when it completes its octet. Now the noble gases have how many outer electrons? Neon down. Eight. Eight. Okay. So neon, argon, krypton, xenon, radon, they have eight valence electrons. Do they want to give any? No. Do they want to take any? No. So what's their oxidation? Zero. Zero. Good. So we can make a little table and write down the noble, the, write down the uh, valence electrons and their oxidation. So group one has one valence electron. Group two has two. Group thirteen has how many? Three. Three. Group fourteen? Fifteen? And the pattern continues. Okay. So based on the number of valence electrons and what an atom is going to do to complete its octet, we can come up with the valence or with the oxidation charge. So does this make sense so far? Give me a thumbs up if you understand the whole valence thing right now. Good. Now, the oxidation. If group one has one valence electron and it gets rid of it, what is its oxidation number? Plus one. Plus one. So all of group one is going to be plus one. All of group two will be what? Plus two. Plus two. We're going to skip over the D block and come back. Group 13. Plus three. Plus three. Now group 14 is kind of interesting because group 14 has four valence electrons. It is equally easy for group 14 to gain four or lose four. So group 14 is special, very special group. It gets plus four or minus four. Whichever it needs to do, it's going to be plus four or minus four. And this is where some exceptions ro roll in um, with 5, 6, and 7. We are not going to deal with the exceptions or the unlikely ions. We're only going to deal with the most likely ion. If you want to deal with exceptions, take chemistry AP. So, nitrogen's group has five valence electrons. Do you think it's easier to lose five or gain three? Gain three. Gain three. It is easier to gain three, so nitrogen's group is minus three. Oxygen's group, what do you think it would be? Negative two. Negative two. It's going to get two more electrons. The halogens? Minus one. Minus one. And noble gases? Zero. Zero. Okay. So that's how oxidation works. It is the charge that an atom will get to complete its octet, or when it completes its octet. Now, like I said, there are exceptions. Once you get to nitrogen's group, there are crazy exceptions depending on what it's bound to. We are not going to deal with the exceptions. If you want to take exceptions, you want to have exceptions, you can take a more advanced class later. Now the D block is special. The D block can be anything from zero to plus seven. The D block can be anything from zero to plus seven. It'll never be negative, and it'll be never be more than seven. But it can be between zero and plus seven. Making it a little, a little bit special. No, it'll always be a whole number. Yeah, that's a good question. Oxidation will always be a whole number. Okay. 
Question? That's a really good question, and it's almost the entire bulk of oxidation nomenclature that we're going to be doing at the end of November. Okay. Yeah. So the question was, how would you know what it is in here? Um, that's like the almost the entire lesson of uh, oxidation nomenclature, which we'll do in November. So we'll, we'll get to that. Okay. Moving right along. Don't write these down because I'm going to give you. Uh, we're going to talk about properties of individual groups. Just know that. I'm going to give you your, each will each, these will each, each get their own page. So alkali metals, lithium down. Alkaline earth metals, beryllium down. The transition metals, of course, these are our transition metals. We call this rectangle here the main block or the main group. P block elements are the main block. The halogens are a special group of the main group. And then of course our noble gases. And at the end, we have at the bottom our rare earths. Okay. So today we're going to talk about the properties of each individual group. Any questions before we jump right in? Then off we go. First group, alkali metals. Alkali metals will end their electron configuration S1. We're talking about lithium down. Notice I did not include hydrogen or helium. It includes hydrogen in group one because hydrogen is special. And the reason I'm using this ancient periodic table diagram from a million years ago is that it puts hydrogen up above, doesn't stick it to lithium, which is the way it should be. Hydrogen is special. It's special. So alkali metals are group one. Alkalis are crazy. I wish I could hand you pieces of sodium, but it's just too dangerous. Um, I have pieces of sodium, which we'll play with later on. But uh, sodium, you can squish it in your hands. It's like really hard Play-Doh, but it's shiny, like metal, like aluminum or steel. It's shiny, but you can squish it. Um, so alkali metals are soft, highly reactive metals. They're so reactive, they so want to get rid of that outer electron that they'll react with water, <coughs> oxygen, your face. They'll react with anything. Your face. That sodium was salt. Sodium is the first ion in salt. So, yeah, exactly. Um, so table salt is sodium chloride, and we talked about this earlier. Um, sodium is a nasty solid, and chlorine is a nasty gas, but you put them together, and the compound they make has very little to do with the elements that make it up, which is typical. Compounds rarely have the same properties as the elements that make them up. We talked about that, so yeah. Um, there you go. There's, Pure sodium is extremely hard to find and, uh, and pretty dangerous to have around. But sodium chloride, you could put that on your french fries. The alkali metals are lustrous. We learned about this word before. Lustrous basically means what? Shiny. Shiny, exactly, basically shiny. They are electrically conductive. These guys make really good electrolytes. And uh, any, pretty much any battery that you use in the last 10 years is going to be a lithium battery. Unless some company is trying to get rid of their old cadmium batteries. But uh, if you ever popped open the battery of your not Apple phone or your laptop, it'll say lithium ion, L-I ion. Or if they're really high grade, LiPo, lithium polymer battery. Lithium polymer is just a fancy lithium ion battery. Because apples don't have uh, removable batteries. Unless you like, you know, pliers. Bang! And they're like, hey, it's right. Oh, I ruined my phone. Yeah. Hmm? Yeah, batteries still. Pretty much every battery now is lithium ion. Um, it's just, it is the best battery technology we have. Old batteries used potassium as their electrolyte, potassium hydroxide. They have low melting points. You could, uh, you could melt sodium in a frying pan pretty easily. You wouldn't want to, because it would react with the metal in the frying pan, but you could do it. 
they have low density. Basically, remember what density means, right? It's how heavy a certain thing is for a given volume. So uh, if I handed you the sodium, you'd be like, wow, that looks like a steel, but it's very, very light because it has very low density. So, yeah. Because it, oh, someone, something that would actually, okay. It has that outer electron, which it really wants to get rid of. So if you give it the opportunity to get rid of that outer electron, it will take that opportunity. Even with things that don't appear to want another electron, atoms always want another electron. Even if they can't complete their octet, they still want more electrons. So the, the answer to your question is really, really complex, and I don't want to approach it until November. But basically what it boils down to is that outer electron is, really wants to get rid of it. So if given the opportunity, another atom with a higher electronegativity will take that, that electron away. And almost everything is a higher electronegativity than the alkali metals. Okay, so the alkaline earth metals, um, if you wrote down the, the properties for the alkali metals, the alkaline earth metals are uh, S2. You can sum up the properties of the alkaline earth metals this way. Same as group one, but not as much. Okay. They're not as electrically conductive, but they are electrically conductive. They're a little more dense. They're a little harder, but they're still pretty soft. Okay. Um, actually, they're, yeah, they're harder. So they make crazy alloys, but for the most part, they can be summed up as just like group one, but not as much. They're pretty reactive, but not as reactive as group one. They have low densities, but not as low density as group one. They're lustrous, but not as much as group, you get the idea, okay. They're still electrically conductive. One thing that's not up here is they make crazy good alloys. Magnesium and uh, beryllium make really good metal alloys because the, their low density allows their alloys to have very, very low densities. Carbon. Just carbon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, carbon is crazy. Um, as charcoal, you can smash it in your hands. As like a block of carbon, you go squish, squish. Your pencil lead is carbon, pretty brittle. But um, carbon also makes up diamond. So you basically get um, four carbon atoms connected to all other three, each carbon atom connected to four others, you get diamond, which is extremely strong. So someone, said, well, it'd be great if we could take the low density of graphite, which is what your pencil is made out of, and give it the strength of diamond, which is what they do. They weave together very fine pieces of graphite. Because molecules have shear strength and they have tensile strength. Um, so basically, compounds have different, dense, different strengths when you try to break them, we try to pull them. Well, carbon fiber works really well. It doesn't like to pull but it's easily broken. Like your, if you take your pencil lead, it's very easy to snap it, but very hard to pull it, pull it apart. Does that make sense? So you basically weave those two things together and you take the best of both worlds. So it's so expensive because the laughter would go through the process of... Yes, exactly. It's expensive because it's expensive to make. Yeah. Um, people are trying to find a way to make it cheaper because they make it cheaper, then we can make all, like right now, really expensive car body parts are made out of them, but if we can make all car body parts that are made out of them, we're in good shape. Don't even get me started on body armor. Okay, so our transition metals there in the middle are D-block metals. This is where we find the most, the coinage metals, copper, silver, and gold. 100 coppers get you a silver, 100 silvers get you a gold. <laughs> and your platinums. <laughs> Then you can buy your broadsword. Okay. They are lustrous. This is where you find the shiniest metals. We want to make mirrors out of silver. Silver is extremely, it's a really good shiny metal. Very, very, very lustrous. They are electrically conductive, which is handy. Usually when you think about electrically conductive elements, we're thinking about gold, copper, and silver. Because gold is so expensive, we usually make wires out of copper. Copper makes really good wires very low electrical resistance. 
And we learned about this word a while back, malleability. But if you don't remember, this is okay. Malleable means you can bang it into a shape and it's gonna hold that shape. Metals are, D-block metals are malleable. You can bang it into a shape and it's gonna hold that shape. Malleable is also a fun word to just use in your daily vernacular, your daily vocabulary. If somebody is gullible or is easily influenced, you can say they are malleable. Daft. Don't be daft. But if you're like someone who is who is malleable can be easily influenced. And here's a fun word, ductile. How do you use that in everyday life? Uh, I don't think you can. Um, <laughs> but uh, ductility is the ability to be drawn into long wires and not break. If you want to see some cool videos, get online and search for how copper wires are made. It's really neat. No, I'm not going to show you right now. Um, but ductility is how we make copper wires that make up pretty much all the components in your cell phone, the speakers and the capacitors. Um, they basically have a shower head and they pour liquid copper into the shower head and the shower head, out of the shower head comes teeny wires and then they stretch and they're still glowing, they're still glowing hot and because they're still slightly molten and they pull those wires and they spin them over reels and then the, the strength and the speed at which they spin them determines how thin the wire gets. So you need a big fat wire if you want to send electricity, you know, really long distance, but you need a really thin wire if you want to make a little speaker for your cell phone. It was pretty slick. It's like, it's like, oh, I look at the shower head and I'm like, oh, imagine liquid metal coming through that shower head. <laughs> the D-block metals are where you find your most hard elements and your most dense elements. Your most hard elements, tungsten and iridium, are right next to your most dense element, osmium. Most of you don't realize it, but you have, most of you have iridium-tipped spark plugs because you don't want your iridium tips to rock plugs to melt with all the explosions that happen in your engine. Several hundred a minute. Yeah, question? When you, when you kept saying liquid gold, they kept saying that like weird Velveeta cheese commercials. Mmm, <laughs> <laughs> Velveeta. Okay. So, a few more groups left. Any questions about the D block? Yeah. Oh, group three through 12. Okay, so good, this is a good question. Group one and two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, and then group 13 starts RP block. Old periodic tables, since you mentioned it, old periodic tables used to call like the main group, group A, and the, the transitive metals group D, so they go 1A, 2A, 3A. Ooh, if you see that, Ball that periodic table up and throw it in the trash. It should be 1, 2, 3 through 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 18. They also have high melting points. Again, you don't want your, uh, you don't want your spark plugs to melt. That little teeny wire and those old style light bulbs, that was tungsten, capital W, because you can run high voltage through tungsten. It will get so hot it will glow, but it won't melt. Same thing for a toaster. You don't want the elements in your toaster to melt when you run electricity through them? Because you want it to be a toaster after the second time you use it? Yeah, toast. Mmm, toast. Okay, main block elements. This is where we find the crazy elements. Pretty much every type of element imaginable is gonna be in the main group. You got solids, liquids, and gases with varied properties. You have things with high melting points. You have things with low melting points. You have hard elements, you have soft elements. You have gases, you have liquids, you have solids. You got everything. This is also where you find silicon and silicon's bros. Some periodic tables draw a little stair step in the middle of the, uh, of the main group. This is because this is where you would find the metalloids. Starting with silicon and going down to antimony and germanium, this is where you find, oops, not there. This is where you find your metalloids, right there. 
So silicon, germanium, arsenic, antimony, bismuth, polonium, tellurium, are uh, basically these are your metalloids. These are elements that have properties of both metals and nonmetals. Uh, I'm sorry, what? You want to make a stair step on the wall? Yeah. Why not? Um, I'll think about it, maybe. So you looked at silicon at the beginning of the year with your elements lab, and I have a mole of silicon right here. It's only 28 grams. And if you looked at silicon, you'd be like, yep, that's definitely a metal. Yeah, it's, it's all shiny. You can, see, you, know, it's, you can see reflections of light. It's definitely a metal. But if you hit a piece of silicon with a hammer, it doesn't squish like a metal, it shatters like glass. So silicon has some properties of metals and some properties of non-metals. And metalloids, yeah, metalloids. All sorts of crazy things you can do with metalloids. You can melt down silicon dioxide and make glass, or you can etch it, yeah, you can etch it and uh, make silicon wafers where we would build computer chips. Bismuth is really heavy but is mostly biologically inert, so it's good at flushing you out. Whoosh. Yeah. Silicon dioxide. Silicon dioxide. Sil one silicon element and two oxygen elements in a compound. And then that is rearranged in different ways to make quartz and feldspar and all sorts of other elements. Okay. This, of course, is where we have the halogens, which is our next element. So we get to the halogens. Any questions about main group? Other questions about main group before we move on to halogens? Some of you are scribbling madly, so I'll give you another 20 seconds to scribble. Okay. Halogens. Halogen means salt former. It means salt former. And the reason it means salt former is because chlorine and, and bromine, when you bind them to things, they form salts. And we'll talk about what a salt is later on. You've learned that there is salt. Can you pass the salt? Later on, we're going to learn about there's actually a classification of the chemicals called salts. Okay, so our halogens are P5. How many valence electrons do halogens have? Seven. Seven. They're so close to getting the octet. That last electron, their desire for that last electron, makes halogens extremely reactive. They're so close to getting that octet, they're going to finish that octet, making them very reactive. They really want that last one. Please, one more. Must has. Okay. So, because they have seven outer electrons, they have very high electron affinity, very high electronegativity, very high ionization energies. And that means they can attack or bond almost anything. You probably remember the video. They had to lock up fluorine in the, uh, in the, because she would dissolve the dishes. I, um, I wasn't here for that. Well, thanks for sharing. So everybody else, um, so when you watch the video on YouTube, remember the video where they had to lock fluorine up because she was so attractive? So, so she stayed home and dissolved the dishes? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, the video. That was an interesting video. Oh, yeah, that was a Love that video. It's super goofy, but really good. There's a lot of good information. And that's not the only one of that type. There's, there's a few others of that type. That was like rated R for cartoons. That was not okay. Did it embarrass you? When she said, when she said get a little closer. <laughs> oh, you guys! You guys are like bumping and grinding in your jar. Yeah, they jump off the cliff and then they get into the water, and the water separates them. And we'll talk about that too. <laughs> no, no, they they live their lives as separated ions. <laughs> well, I, I'm, I'm glad you're thinking about it because we, we will actually talk about that with the next unit. We're talking about how 
and when a positive and negative ion are in a lattice, a solid, when they go into water, they will separate into, out into their positive and negative ions. <laughs> See, don't you feel left out because you weren't here on Friday? Yeah! Yeah, you got to get on YouTube. You got to get on YouTube during lunch and watch the video. We are not watching that again. Oh, yes, you are. Yeah. Good question. Remember the seven. Okay, guys, my turn. Remember the seven elements that are diatomic, the Brinkelhoffs? They never exist alone. So, four of those seven are in the halogens. You will never see fluorine, chlorine, bromine, or iodine all by themselves. They will always be bound to something. Or if they can't find anything to bound to, they'll have to bound, bind with themselves. Remember the narrative?